God, in the next 30 minutes or so, we want to see Jesus. I believe that the book of Genesis that we've been working through for the last four weeks, the book of Genesis primarily is about the character of God. And we see your heart. We see your longings. We see your character. We see how you respond. And God, I pray that as we know you more, that we will become more like you as we see in Jesus. So would you speak to us this morning, whether we've read this a million times before and we understand it, we get it, and we live for you, or whether we're new here and we're still trying to even just figure this out. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here to speak to each one of us right where we need today. And we commit this next half hour to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Last week, we left off with this understanding. We said that God is so awesome. God is so powerful and sovereign. And yet, at the same time, he is personal, and he's intimate, and he's caring. That God is watching, he's engaged, and full of grace. This all-powerful, sovereign God longs to be in relationship with you. And that is the core to his heart. That's what he's been planning from the beginning. And we see this as we journey through the book of Genesis. Uh, this all-powerful God longs to be in relationship with you. Uh, like his original promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, and, and the promise and the covenant he made starts with, I will be your God and you will be my people. Underneath that comes that I will make you a great nation and a great people. And I will bring salvation to the world. I will bless the whole world through you. But he wants to bless the whole world through you, bring salvation. Why? So that he will be our God and we will be his people. And this we see all the way through. So what we've seen so far is that this God, who, who seems, who knows, who is involved and engaged, seems to bless these people a lot. And, and yet he blesses them so much, but what we've seen is they continue to live distant from him at arm's length, calling their own shots, twisting things around, desperately, in a sense, running their lives into the ground even though God continues to bless them. And so the resulting question that I've got from, from more than a few of you in the last week is as we've read through Genesis so far, we see this evil, this twisted, lying, uh, manipulating, sneaky, hiding, uh, th this wicked behavior showing up page after page after page after page in this deception. And yet what it looks like is it looks like God is just kind of letting it happen. He's not really doing any anything about it. And so I've got a lot of questions about that in the last little bit. And so I want to kind of talk about that this morning. And if you have your Bible, go to Genesis 38. If you're reading with us, you probably read this yesterday. In chapter 38, all of this evil and twistedness and, and lies and deceit and craziness kind of comes to a head. It seems to be about the worst chapter so far. And, and, and in some ways, if there's little ears in here this morning... Um, you may want to sit down this afternoon and have a little conversation if they have questions. In chapter 38, I've always wanted to talk about this chapter. I've never really had an opportunity or a reason to dig into this chapter. It seems out of this whole narrative so far to be completely out of the blue. It doesn't seem to fit in. Uh, there's a lot of ugliness in it. But I believe it fits perfectly. Now, we've just started the story of Joseph. 
and Joseph is a boy, and we're seeing things happen, and then all of a sudden, out of, this, out of the blue, the story changes, and we have one chapter talking about Judah, which is one of Joseph's older brothers. And every Sunday school class has skipped this chapter. We don't hear about it on Sunday mornings. We don't talk about it when we tell the story. Um, and the Bible narrative, as I said, is already on Joseph, so we just kind of blindly look away from this chapter and keep on going with Joseph. But I think it's absolutely critical. It's ugly, and it's twisted. But I think it's absolutely critical, and I want us to look at that. It gives us a window into Judah. And, and Judah is the one... If you've been tracking with us, God's covenant and God's promise comes to Abraham. And Abraham passes that on to his son Isaac. And Isaac passes that on to his son Jacob. And, and God's promise that I will be your God, you will be my people, I will bless the whole world through you, I will make you great, I will bring salvation to the world, that promise goes through Judah. And I want us to look at that today because this... Um, kind of breaks the pattern of what God is doing. Let's look at chapter 38. And Judah left, about, about that time, the chapter right before this, Judah and his 11 brothers sell Joseph to the, uh, eventually into slavery in Egypt. And it was Judah's idea to do that. And so we have chapter 38, about that time, Judah left home. Lots of speculation about that. There's lots of different theories or scholars have looked at that. Uh, most common, um, the Bible scholars believe that he left home because this whole thing that happened with Joseph had really messed him up. And he got away. And he moved to Adullam, where he stayed with a man named Hira. And there he saw a Canaanite woman, the daughter of Shua, and he married her. Now, if you've been tracking, we know already that this is not okay. And, and, and with his ancestors three generations previous, uh, they made sure that their sons, especially the sons that the promise was continuing through, that they married within the right group of people. Because breaking that and stepping outside of that was not okay. Here's Judah, who we know is the one the promise is continuing through. And right off the bat, he's jumping into, he's jumping out of God's plan for this pure bloodline. And he marries a Canaanite woman. And when he slept with her, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. The boy's name was Ur. She became pregnant again and gave birth to another son. And she named him Onan. And when she gave birth to a third son, they named him Selah. At the same time of Selah's birth, they were living in Kizib. Now, we see here in verse 6, and, and as we go through this, if nothing else, let's look for Judah and look for Judah's character. In the course of time, Judah arranged for his firstborn son, Ur, to marry a young woman named Tamar. But Ur was a wicked man in the Lord's sight, so the Lord took his life. Interesting. Because one of the things we've noticed so far is it seems like God is just kind of letting this evil go. All I can say when I read that is, wow, he must have been bad. If God has been letting all of this go and people run their course and not really stepping in and intervening, he just continues to bless people and pursue them and chase them with grace and with love, even in their evilness, all of a sudden we've got a young man that's so evil, God just says, says you're done, and he kills him. Verse 8, when Judah said to, and when Judah said to Ur's other brother, Go and marry Tamar, as our law requires of the brother of man who has died. You must produce heir, an heir for your brother. It's strange, but very normal. That was the law. But Onan was not willing to give, have a child who would not be his own heir. So whenever he had intercourse with his brother's wife, he spilled the semen on the ground and prevented her from having a child who would belong to his brother. 
Verse 10, but the Lord considered it evil for Onan to deny a child to his dead brother. So the Lord took Onan's life too. Now this is getting even more extreme because that, out of all the things we've seen so far, the manipulating and the cheating and the lies and on and on and on and the rage and the murder, um, this seems pretty little, doesn't it, in comparison? But what this is doing, this is giving us a window into this family. That, that Judah has raised two sons already that were so wicked that God killed them. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. And Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, go back to your parents' home and remain a widow until my son Shelah is old enough to marry you. But Judah didn't really intend to do this. Kind of shows you a little bit about his character. Because he was afraid that Shelah, his other son, would also die like his two brothers. How is it that all three of his sons are growing up so wicked and twisted and evil? Most Bible scholars believe that in this case, the apple isn't falling far from the tree. That this whole household is a picture of that from top to bottom. The, the, just an unruly household. And some years later, Judah's wife died. And after the time of mourning was over, Judah and his friend Hira, the a Dolomite, went up to Timnah to supervise the shearing of his sheep. And someone told Tamar, look, your father-in-law is coming up to Timnah to shear his sheaf. So Tamar was aware that Shelah had grown up, but no arrangements had been made for her to come and marry him. So she changed out of her widow's clothing and covered herself with a veil to disguise herself. And she sat beside the road at the entrance to the village, which the road, on the road to Timnah, Judah noticed her, and thought she was a prostitute since she had covered her face. So he stopped. It's getting worse. Tamar was married to Ur who died. The law says that Ur's brother then should take her as a wife so that Ur's bloodline can continue and he would have an heir. They didn't want to do that. They refused to do that. They were going to give wait until the younger brother grew up but they didn't really even want to do that. So they sent her to her father's house. That's not okay. Now, in, in that culture, when you got married, you paid the father's house for the bride. It was almost like a purchase. And, and she would no longer be the responsibility of her parents. She was now the responsibility of this family. No matter what happens, it's their responsibility to care for her. Uh, until she died. And here for him to say, you know what, just go home to your family, uh, would have been abhorrent in that culture. To go home to her family, they are not responsible to care for her anymore. They've let her go. They've almost, not really, but they've sold her to another family. And so often when a, a widow would come home to her own family, they don't care for her. And often they become uh, very poor and desperate. And as I read this week, it says sometimes in the worst situations, they would become prostitutes in order just to stay alive. That's not the case here. What we have the situation here is that uh, she finds out that Judah is coming to town on a business deal. And she takes off her widow's clothes, dresses like a prostitute, and sits at the entrance of the town. Now, why in the world would she do that? Why in the world would she do that knowing she wants to get Judah? Why would she dress like a prostitute unless she knew something about Judah? Was this common for him when he went on business trips? Did everybody know? We're starting to see a glimpse into this family and maybe why the three sons were so evil. Not a great guy. 
So Judah noticed her and thought she was a prostitute since she had covered her face. Verse 16, so he stopped and he propositioned her. Let me have sex with you, he said, not realizing that it's his daughter-in-law. Oh, how much will you pay me to have, have sex with me, Tamar said. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, Judah promised. And what will you give me to guarantee that you will send me the goat, she asked. Well, what kind of guarantee do you want? She, she answered, leave me your identification seal or your signet. And you know what a signet ring is, right? Uh, the signet, in most wouldn't have a ring at this time. It would be the same kind of thing, but it would be on a cord, and they would keep it. It's their identification. It's their way of signing everything. Leave me your identification seal and its cord and your walking stick you're carrying. And Judah gave them to her. All of those things he leaves are personal identification. No DNA test is ever going to be required if anything happens because he's left things that absolutely identify himself. He had intercourse with her and she became pregnant. Verse 19, afterwards she went back home, took off her veil and put on her widow's clothing as usual. So later, after they've gone home, Judah asked his friend Hira to, to uh, take the young goat to the woman and pick up the things that he had given her as a guarantee. But Hira couldn't find her. So he asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who was sitting beside the road at the entrance to NAM? They said, we've never had those prostitutes here. So he returned to Judah and told him, I couldn't find her anywhere. And the men of the village said they'd never had prostitutes there. And, and he, let her keep, he said, let her keep the things I gave her then. I sent the young goat as we agreed, but you couldn't find her. We'd be the laughing stock of the village if we went back again to look at her. So about three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has acted like a prostitute, and now because of this, she's pregnant. Bring her out and let her be burned, Judah demanded. Not just, oh well, she can keep the stuff, who cares about her? But when the news report comes that his family member had been prostituted and, and pregnant, he's so quick to cast judgment on her. Knowing full well that this is probably common for him. But he's saying, she's scum. She's part of our family. She's disgracing our family. Um, we don't think at this point at all he has any idea that it's Tamar. He's not trying to eliminate any, any way of getting caught or anything like that. Nobody had put two or two together yet. He's not trying to cover his tracks. But I believe we're really seeing Judah's character here. Not just his character, his whole family, him and his whole household. So Judah had 11 brothers. He had 11 brothers, and this is the one that God chooses to continue his promise and his covenant through. We'll find out a little later, this is the one that will be in the line in the descendant of Jesus. And that doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me at all. Why Judah? This begs the question I answered earlier. What's going on, God? You know the evil. You're seeing the evil. And you're just, are you okay with this? God's covenant and his promise to Abraham was, I will be your God, you will be my people. I will make you a great nation through your descendants. The whole world will be blessed through them. And salvation will come to the world through your line. God's promise has passed from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, and from Jacob to, to Judah? Now, all of them were less than wonderful people. But now Judah, he's taken the cake. And I think this chapter here that we so often skip over because it's awkward and it's ugly 
and we'd rather just continue on with the story of Joseph, I think it's critical here. Now, it's always dangerous to say, if I was God, so I'll say, if you were God, wouldn't you pick Joseph? We finally, out of all of these stories, have a character who is honorable and upright and just and follows God and desperately remains straight and obedient and upright. Why wouldn't you choose that son to be the one who carries the promise? The beloved son, the upright one. God wanted a pure bloodline going on here. But all these people are so messed up, and it seems to be getting worse. Has, lot, has God lost complete control? If you ask that question in your reading this week, then you're not alone. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you've done something less than valiant, and you try to wiggle your way out of it so that nobody will know? But then it becomes even more obvious, and other people know, maybe lots of other people know. Well, now it's way worse. This is what happens with Judah. And Judah, uh, in the next verses here, gets a really abrupt and a rude awakening. His eyes get open to see his own character. And I wonder if he starts asking, how have I gone so far? How in the world did I get this far? And, and I think we begin to see him reflect on his life. And, and, and some remorse starts to take place. Eventually we see him repent. But we don't see Judah again now for 20 years. With Abraham, the promise came through Abraham, and we see Abraham's whole life story. With Isaac, the promise goes through Isaac, we see his whole life story. With Jacob promise goes through Jacob we see his whole life story and we know nothing about Judah except this but we know change started happen if we fast forward 20 years we come to the very end of the book of Genesis which you'll read later on this week in chapter 43 we see a glimpse of some real deep authentic compassion happening in Judah as he explains to Joseph about his younger brother and, it, and the love of his father and how he lost his brother and this is all he's got, we see that deep, deep compassion. And we see um, Jacob and Judah have this conversation and Jacob promising his father that if we take Benjamin back to Egypt as Joseph has instructed, you'll read this this next week, that, that I personally will be responsible we see him changing and taking responsibility as a family member and as a man and stepping up. And then when they're in Egypt and, and Joseph uh, says um, that Benjamin needs to stay, it's Judah that steps out of, up out of all the brothers and says, no, 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 I will stay as your slave. Let Benjamin go. What a switch in character. But it doesn't continue there. Uh, in, in chapter 49, at the end of their father's life, he goes through all 12 brothers and gives them uh, their blessing. Well, not all of them are blessings. But he goes through every single brother, all 12 of them, and says, here's what's going to happen for you in your future. Six of them are devastating. The evil of their character is going to grow into their life and it's going to impact them severely. Six of them are very positive. And in Judah, when he comes to Judah years later at the end of Jacob's life, he's got nothing bad to say about Judah. As a matter of fact, he says, Judah, you're the lion of the family. And he says, the scepter, the scepter will not be removed from you forever. The one who is coming, who will receive all of the honor the one that the prophets had talked about, he is coming and he will come through you, Judah. We see through these little glimpses here that by the end, Judah had completely done a huge 180. Everything in his life was different. 
And we see uh, later on in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, we see that the prophets say that Jesus will come through the line of Judah. We see in Revelation chapter 19, in, in Christ's second coming, we see this same picture that's picked up in that chapter. We see in Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy of Jesus. Guess who's in there? Judah and Tamar. Because it's Tamar's son, through Judah and Tamar's son, Perez. They're in the genealogy. So God is trying to put together this perfect bloodline to bring the Messiah. And, and we've, got, we've got Tamar and Judah in that list. And that just seems puzzling, doesn't it? But this chapter, so often skipped in the middle because it's awkward and difficult and ugly, is so important because it's the story of the redemption, of the transformation of Judah's life. Judah has become aware of his, his mistakes and his ways. Uh, his resolve starts to, to fix it, to assume the proper household responsibilities. At one point, willing and uh, coming up with the idea to sell his brother to save his own hide. And then later, I will go to, to become a slave to rescue my brother. What a difference. Without this ugly chapter, we have no idea the life that Judah lived. Here's what I see. I see God knew all along. I see that God continues to pursue people. I see God continues to call people forward. That God is not distant and ignoring evil. I see that God is continually working to set people up to see him and to know him. Almost bending over backwards so that people would see him and know him. If we fast forward to Romans chapter 1, we see this. In Romans chapter 1, we're looking, at this, looking back at all the history, and it says um, in, in verse 19, you know the truth about God. Even by looking at creation, you know the truth about God. And in verse 21, they knew, but they weren't interested in worshiping or even thanking him. So he gave them over to their ways, to their own heart's desires. You can read that for yourself. And God's heart is broken in that. In Genesis, story after story after story, generation after generation, we see this same thing. The people knew about God. And yet they decided to continue their way. And some of them responded. God has a plan. And God will continue to make his plan happen. He knows what we do. He knows where we'll go. He knows the choices we will make. And God knows the full picture. We just see one day at a time. God knows who will get there. And God knows who, they, who will and who won't. And God is not looking away in the evil. He's not just ignoring it. He's actually going somewhere with, and ridiculously patient and full of grace. So God's covenant with Abraham, back in chapter 12, and the promises that went with it, I will be your God, you will be my people. There's nothing that God wants more. The promise that goes along with that about becoming a great nation and that the blessing of the whole world God's promising that and will work that because he wants us to be his people. He wants to be in relationship. Now, Abraham, we see God's patience and continual grace and calling him forward despite the good, despite the bad. He continues to call him, and we see Abraham grow and change. In Jacob, 
or in Isaac, we see God's continual blessing on his life. We see God continue to slowly refine uh, Isaac's character. We see God's patience and continual grace in calling him forward. We look at Jacob, and if we had time, I would get into all of Jacob's life here because there's great detail in that too. But he starts out as a manipulator, a trickster with lies and stealing and arranging situations for his own personal gain. And yet through his life, so many one-on-one confrontations with God. But his life ends and his name has been changed which we'll talk about next week in his whole character. God changes the character of him and the direction of his life, and we see God's patience, and we see God's grace calling him forward into relationship with him, and we see Jacob grow. All along, God was pursuing Abraham. And we see Abraham's whole world change. All along, God was pursuing Isaac. And we see Isaac's heart change. We see Isaac's whole world change. All along, God was pursuing Jacob. And, and, and Jacob had a lot harder time with it. If, if you read this, most of Jacob's life, he didn't call God my God. He said, he's the God of my father. Even when he prays, he prays to the God of my father. And then when God shows up and he really struggles and wrestles through all of this is the first time we see him say, he is my God. And then we see a whole direction of his life change. But we see through through. Uh, Jacob, his whole life begin, his whole world begin to change. And then we come to Judah. And we've got the worst of the worst as far as characters go, but we see God continue to pursue him and care for him and give him grace. And with great patience, we finally see Judah's heart starts to change. And then his whole world changes. With patience and grace, God is fulfilling his promises. And he's allowing them along the way to choose with their own free will how they want to live their lives and how they want to respond. And God is continuing to work and wait for them to come around. And I think this is important for us to see in this chapter. Judah was a train wreck. And I don't know about you, but there was a lot of, a a big chunk of my life where I I had made my life into a train wreck. And if you knew me when I was 18, maybe 20 years old, I was full of lies and full of manipulation. And I would use people around me to get where I wanted to get. I would manipulate situations for my own gain. There was a lot of ugliness, and I hurt people. Ended up in drugs and drinking to kind of try to calm it all down and to fit in. All along, I knew God was pursuing me. All along, I knew God was right there. I just didn't want to surrender. I fought it. I was a train wreck. I was off the rails and going nowhere fast. And it was a process in me to finally coming to surrender. And I think it's probably all of us in our own way, since we're all different. We are all flawed. We all have sinned. We're all distant from God. But God is right there, and God is pursuing us, calling us, wooing us, chasing us. It doesn't matter what we've done or how far off the rails we've taken our life. God is right there, patiently calling and full of grace. So I started by asking, does God, does God just sit back and let all this happen? All of this evil and just look away. All of this brokenness and evil is not God's plan. God is calling us away from that brokenness and that evil and ourselves. I believe that God is wooing us forward all of the time and and, and bending over backwards to initiate a response. And he's already done everything necessary for us to know him. God continues his plan, and not even sin 
can take his plan down. Judah was a train wreck. And God let him do his own thing with his own free will. And I think we are the same. But like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and me, God is right there. And he knew what we would do. He knew where we would go. He knows what we're going to choose and what we're going to do. He knows how he made you. And he will continue to pursue us with grace to bring us to the place where we're in a relationship with him, where we can become all that he created us to be. I love the fact that, that as, God, as God unfolds his story of redemption and love and desire for relationship with us, I love that all the way through that he uses messed up people. And I love that the Bible doesn't hide chapters like this because it's messed up. But it shows us the character of God that God is continually pursuing. If there's anything that summarizes the book of Genesis, Genesis is about the character of God. I don't see God as distant, looking away, letting evil happen. I see God as faithful. I see God as working, even when everything's a mess. In the middle of the evil and sin, I see God relentlessly pursuing. God pours out love when we deserve death. God continues his plan, and sin and evil do not succeed against it. God pursues people with grace and with patience. God calls you forward, one step at a time. And God works to slowly build the character and change the hearts of people. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I ask before that we would see you. And I think as we go through Genesis, there are brilliant pictures of wonder and glory and nice that... We see you. We see your character. We see your creativity. We see your love. But even in chapters like this that are just a mess, we see your patience. We see your grace. We see your love. We see that you actually pursue us for this relationship, that you want desperately to be our God and for us to be your people, that you want to create in us a new heart to to. to to create in us uh, who we were created to be. That your love and your patience. We see that you allow us to choose how we want with our own free will. But at the same time, with grace and with patience, you continue to pursue us and chase us and call us towards yourself. Thank you. And God, knowing even here, there's some like me who just made a train wreck of our lives. We have never gone too far. We learned that from Judah. We have never gone too far that you are not able to rescue, to forgive, to reestablish and restore, restore us to relationship with you, to make us all that you created us to be thank you. So God, do your work this morning in us. Challenge us that we would love because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. 